Compute the cost. Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 33, New English Translation. Now, large crowds were accompanying Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, wanting to build a tower, doesn't sit down first and compute the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish the tower, all who see it will begin to make fun of him. They will say, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to confront another king in battle, will not sit down first and determine whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he cannot succeed, he will send a representative while the other is still a long way off and ask for terms of peace. In the same way, therefore, not one of you can be my disciple if he does not renounce all his own possessions. Salt is good, but if the salt loses its flavor, how can its flavor be restored? It is of no value for the soil or for the manure power pile it is to be thrown out. The one who has ears to hear had better listen. Well, the wedding is over and the marriage has begun. The newlyweds are back in Colorado enjoying their lives together in their new house and now mom and dad can relax. I'm grateful that we had the wedding here because it turns out that we needed the help of a few good friends to pull it off. We want to thank all of you for your help because getting ready for this wedding took more than we could do alone. Which brings me to today's topic. We've been studying the commands of Christ and today's command has to do with the cost of discipleship. It is important that I explain why we must talk about cost when it comes to discipleship. Salvation is by grace. It is God's work and therefore it is by grace since no one deserves it. We cannot bribe God with good works because everything good comes from him anyway. Trying to bribe God is like a child giving his parents money from his big piggy bank to get what he wants. Well, the piggy bank and the money in it comes from the parents already. You cannot blackmail God either. He does nothing wrong, so you cannot extort him into giving what you want by recognizing some misdeed and threatening to tell on him. He has no authority higher than he is, so there would be no one to tell. If we got what we deserved, we would all be incinerated. So when we talk about the cost of a discipleship, we're not talking about something we could do to buy in to grace. Grace cannot be bought into. It is free and it must be free or else it is not grace. Discipleship is our human response to God's grace of salvation. It is a life of repentance and response to the gospel of God's grace. We don't produce grace, we respond to grace. But our response is an indication that we have experienced grace. Some people talk about cheap grace. There is no cheap grace. God's grace cost God the life of his only son. God's grace cost Jesus the cross. God's grace is more costly than any other gift. When people mean, what people mean when they talk about cheap grace is cheap repentance. It's saying yes to God without reading the fine print of the salvation contract. It's not cheap grace, it's cheap discipleship. It's saying to Jesus, I do when you have no intention of doing anything. Today's text reveals that Jesus was in a situation where a lot of people were being tempted to embrace cheap discipleship. We're following the Gospels as they describe the life and ministry of Jesus. We started out in Galilee, then went to Judea, and now we've crossed the Jordan River to the region of Perea. Jesus will only spend a few months here, but his ministry here will be hugely popular. 
large crowds will show up wherever he goes. But because there will be so many crowds, many of the people who come to Jesus will not really understand what he's calling them to do. Let's look at today's text. First, there is the question at hand, fan or follower? The text tells us that there were large crowds accompanying Jesus. It does not say that they were following him. It does not say that they had already become his disciples, like Peter and John and the others were. Remember our study from of Mr. Eidelman's book? They were fans, not true followers. A fan is interested in Jesus, but not interested enough to do what he says to do. J. Dwight Pentecost talks about three different kinds of people who claim Jesus. He talks about the crowds who were curious about Jesus, those who were convinced about him, and those who were committed to him. Those who were curious might stick around to see his miracles and listen to his teachings. They might even become convinced that he is who he says he is, but that would not be enough. Jesus says a person is not truly committed unless he's willing to renounce all his possessions and follow him. The question for all of us today is, are we a curious fan looking on Jesus from the outside as a possible sideline in our lives? Are we convinced that he is who he says he is? If so, isn't it time we, all, we became all in? Jesus came to save whosoever will, but it isn't whosoever will be curious. It isn't even whosoever will be convinced. It is whosoever will follow. To teach this, Jesus told too many parables. He illustrated his command with two hypotheticals. There was a tower illustration. He asked, which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't sit down first and compute the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish the tower, all who see it will begin to make fun of it. The tower Jesus was talking about was not like the Tower of Babel. It was a farmer's tower. It was a structure designed to prevent robbers from stealing a farmer's harvest. The farmer or some of his family members or slaves could perch themselves in that tower and keep watch over the crops and keep people from sneaking in and making off with the family's food. To protect the whole crop, the tower had to be large enough to provide the guards with visibility of the whole field, and it also had to be substantial enough to safely house all those guarding the crop. Jesus said that if a person was going to build such a contraption, he had to think about it. He had to get the proper supplies and construct it in such a way that it would not fall apart after it was constructed. It's not about just wanting to build a tower. It's about investing in the construction so that the tower will serve its purpose. It's not how you begin, it's how you end. If the tower collapses, it can't serve its purpose. If the tower, a farmer cannot complete the construction, it will bring shame to him and not honor. Then Jesus told a battle illustration. He switched characters and the farmer became a king. The king has an enemy and he contemplates going to battle against that enemy. He decides to risk 10,000 soldiers in his army but he learns that his enemy has 20,000 soldiers ready and waiting. Suddenly, negotiation sounds a lot more practical. Then the plan, renunciation. Jesus' message to those crowds in Perea was that building the appropriate tower is going to cost everything you own. Coming against the real enemy in their lives is going to require them to renounce all their own possessions. Renunciation is what turns the curious and convinced into truly committed. Renunciation turns fans into followers. Remember last week we talked about the man who planned the great banquet? He sent out the invitation and lots of people said, sign me up. But then when the banquet was ready, they all gave excuses. They had said yes, but they were not really committed. Each of them had something in his life that he was not willing to give up. For one, it was a tract of land. For another, it was a team of oxen. For another, it was a new bride. But in the story, the man chose a new group of invitees. He swore that none of those originally invited 
would taste his feast. Now that is a warning for all of us who gather in Jesus' name. Those who are just curious about Jesus might fool those around them, but the master of the feast knows. Those who are merely convinced about Jesus might seem like sheep, but they're really goats. One day there will be a separation. Sheep on the right, goats on the left. Being convinced about Jesus is not enough. The cost is commitment. Finally, Jesus talked about the product, influence. What does it look like when a person is truly committed to Jesus? Maybe we should ask what it tastes like because that is how Jesus described the product of a disciple. He said, salt is good, but if salt loses its flavor, how can its flavor be restored? It's of no value for the soil or for the manure pile is to be thrown out. Flavorless salt is not salt. It's a substance that might look like salt, but it does not salt anything. <laughs> an uncommitted Christian is an oxymoron. I asked Mr. Google for some examples of an oxymoron, and he said, accurate estimate, alone together, awfully good, bittersweet, climb down, close distance, grow smaller, and jumbo shrimp. An uncommitted Christian looks like salt, but doesn't salt. He looks like he's saved, but he doesn't obey the Lord's command. So he's not saved and he's not going to get anybody else saved. He looks like he's going to the banquet, but he's really responded to the second invitation with an excuse. On that day, during his ministry in Perea, the Lord challenged all the fans to become actual followers. He challenged the curious and even the merely convinced to stop sitting on the fence and become committed. He challenges you and me to do the same thing. He challenges us to renounce all our possessions, anything that keeps us from being all in. Real repentance does not share the kingdom of God with any other priorities. Real repentance makes building the kingdom priority number one. God bless y'all. Have a great day.